Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Darwin Festival podcast. I'm Chris Smith. This week, the man who created and completed the Human Genome Project and in the process won a Nobel Prize for doing it. I'm John Solston. I've been working in Cambridge off and on all my life. Right now I'm also slightly attached to the University of Manchester. I'm a chemist originally um, here in Cambridge and then I got into biology um, working with Sidney Brenner on a a small nematode worm. It's a little tiny animal where we we looked at uh, development in great detail, particularly cellular development. And it's a model for animals. And this was actually how I got into working on DNA because it was very important in order to discover all the genes that control the development of this little animal, we had to work on all of the DNA, which we call the genome. And so it wasn't a big step for me then to become associated with the Human Genome Project uh, when that came along uh, during the 90s. And uh, then I joined with colleagues and we, we got that data out as well. So you worked up in the worm, what was going to play out in the human? Exactly. And, and particularly, though, I would say with the worm, I learned why it was valuable to do that, why it was important in particular to find all the genes. I think before we started looking at whole genomes, uh, many people thought, well, if we just look at a few key genes, we'll get it all sorted out. It turns out that life really is a lot more complicated than that. The genes are very interactive, and you really have to look at all the families, uh, the, the, the entire families of genes in order to work it out, and that meant looking at the whole genome. So it was, it was, a, it was a learning process that we began in the worm and then continued with the human. I remember when I was at, at university and we were talking about how the nervous system develops, people would talk about human beings have, having something like 100,000 genes. Mm-hmm. By the time you finished, you'd got that number down to something like half that number, even lower now. Or less, indeed, yes. It turns out, in fact, the number of genes in a worm or a fruit fly or a human are very much in the same order. And to be honest, that 100,000 uh, figure was complete speculation. People just thought that uh, because humans were big and complex and obviously terribly important, they ought to have more genes than flies. To a certain extent, though, you bit off quite a bit more than you anticipated chewing, didn't you? Because we thought that solving the DNA sequence would tell us an enormous amount about how cells work, and then we discover, actually, it's a lot more complicated than that. There's a lot more to this story. There's a whole layer of complexity because you get the products of those genes changed in cells and differently expressed. We get different levels of expressions of genes in different cells, different groups of cells, Mm. and so the work's really only just beginning. Indeed it is. And to be honest, although, of course, I was guilty at times of a certain amount of hype when I was trying to get funding for the Human Genome Project, I never for a moment imagined in myself that it was more than a tool, because that's exactly how it was with the nematode. The point of sequencing the nematode DNA was to provide a tool for nematode biologists to use. And the same is exactly true with the human, only now, of course, there's enormous numbers of people, particularly medics, who are interested in it as well. So it's not just an academic discipline. I read your book that you wrote with Georgina Ferry, which was called The Common Thread. Mm. And the most reassuring bit of that book for me was the bit where you say, I've been working at the Molecular Biology Laboratory in Cambridge for something like 12 years, where my boss said, perhaps you should write some of this up into a paper. Hasn't science changed? <laughs> you know, how many people would get away with being in their job for 12 years and not actually publishing anything, just building a huge body of knowledge that they then could turn into a Nobel Prize later? Yes, I, I think it wasn't quite as long as 12 years, but it's true that, that, that Sydney and, and other people at the LMB were not particularly rushing to publish. As a matter of fact, I think we need to rediscover that quite strongly. I'm, I'm working with people who feel that um, really people are publishing far too much. The, you know, the, the pressure to, to for output numerically, is exceeding the capacity of the system to cope. And, you know, we, we, we know we're all very worried about the level of fraud and falsification which goes on. And part of the reason for that is pressure to publish and the inability of the referees to keep up with what's going on. So I, I think if we can find ways of cutting back the rate and keep up the quality, we'll have much better um, scientific communication. Well, the reason I brought this up is because, of course, the person who we're here to acknowledge this week, Charles Darwin, sat on his manuscript for 50 years, almost 50 years, but for a very long time, before he actually put forward a very robust synthesis of what he'd been working on his entire life. 
So your argument then, we should try and return to that kind of mindset. Well, that, that certainly was extreme. And of course, he was triggered by a competitor in the end and rushed into print. <laughs> but interestingly, um, the, the, the data, the, the, the communication was there. And, and in fact, the reason he was able to get a back-to-back paper into the Royal Society with Wallace uh, was that there was communication with Asa, Asa Gray, which proved that he already had uh, the, these ideas well formulated. If he'd not been doing that, then I think he would probably have been scooped. Um, so I think that he, he was not uncommunicative, but it was a simpler age in the sense of the numbers of people involved in, a, involved in the field, and he was able to do much of it by correspondence. Th- this is true very often of, of early fields. It was true of early work with nucleic acids after the time of the, the discovery of the structure of DNA. It was true with our own early work with the nematode. A lot of informal communication. And it's only when fields get very big that the, the public communication gets so important. But, of course, one should publicly communicate anyway because everybody should have access to science. So I'm a great believer in open access for that reason. It's quite interesting you saying about Charles Darwin feeling the pressure of getting scooped because you found yourself in that position with the Human Genome Project and the guys in America who were rushing to commercialise all this technology. And actually, you said, no, we, we want to make sure this remains in the public domain because of the potential to change the world scientifically. Yes, I must remind you, it's just one call corporation in America that was doing that. I mean, the, the major part of powerful it. corporation. Oh, yes, indeed. But what I mean is that the, the public consortium uh, had very strong components in America, the strongest, in fact. So it, it was Americans on both sides of the equation in this one. But it's true, as far as this country was concerned, I was the spokesman. And it probably is quite influential that the Wellcome Trust took a long, strong stand on the public release of data that strengthened the hand of the guys from NIH and made sure their funding continued to flow in the public sector. Obviously, Charles Darwin didn't know about the concept of DNA and heritability in, in quite the way we understand it today. Um, what do you think he would make? of the work that you've done? Oh, I'm sure he'd be extremely excited. I mean, the clear thing about, about Darwin is he was such a polymath. He was able to take in over all the range of, of, of disciplines. I mean, it's so important that he was a very good geologist, as, as well as a naturalist, as well as a, a dissector, an anatomist. You know, he was doing everything. And he was putting all this together, and he would just take all this on board straight away. The lovely thing, actually, uh, that I think from, from the point of view of evolution and of the, his, his, his natural selection... Um, insight is the completely orthogonal evidence that's come from comparative genomics. What comparative genomics means is is looking at the DNA of many, many different organisms and comparing them. And what we find is immediately falling out, independently of all other biological evidence, is the unity of life. So we had it already in terms of taxonomy and classification, and now we have it by just looking at these molecules. And we see that, that everything is linked to everything else. So it's a wonderful confirmation, which I think you, you know, sort of has helped to, to lay to rest any, any, any uh, lingering doubts about whether evolution is a theory or not. It's not a theory anymore, it's a fact. We can just see everything. Indeed, seeing a gene from a jellyfish making a bacterium glow green is pretty much all the evidence we really need. That, that well, there you're transferring a gene, but you mean, yes, that the gene can be moved and, and works in some fashion. The ubiquity of the genetic code. Yes, I mean, yes. it doesn't matter whether you're a bacterium or a human or a banana. That's We're right. still running the same genetic code that, as all ourselves. That, the most important point, that we are running the same basics, uh, basic mechanism. So what's next for you? Got a Nobel Prize, Secrets of Human Genome. <laughs> Where do you go from here? <laughs> Well, I've become very interested in, in the ethics of science and uh, science and society, if you like, uh, in, in general. But in particular, I think that we need to introduce a more thoughtful way in which we apply science. It's, rather, um, it's thought rather out of date in some quarters now to talk about, about you know, scientific discovery on the one hand and application of science on the other but I think we need to we need to keep that in mind not not in a sort of mutually exclusive way but the fact that when we're discovering science we should be totally free obviously you have to have money and so on and space to do it but we should be completely free to explore when we come to apply science 
so we're rolling it out, as they say, into society, then I think one has to take on board the ethical considerations, the social considerations, and the whole thing has to be much more democratic. So I, th- I think there is a, a lack of, of understanding that, that these two things are different. And also, there's a very strong tendency at the moment to leave the second part entirely to market forces. And that, I think, is a big mistake when we come to, for example, the supply of drugs, where we know that only the richest people in the world have access to medicines. The poorest people do not. We need to fix that. And this is what I mean by the ethics of science. A noble cause for a Nobel laureate. That was Sir John Salston, who was one of the key orchestrators behind the project to sequence the human genome. That's all for this week. Thank you for listening. And do please try to join me again next time for more insights from the Darwin Festival archives. There are more editions of this podcast and more podcasts available from our website at thenakedscientist.com. I'm Chris Smith, and until next time, goodbye.